Yeah, now, perfect. Well, let me introduce uh, Francois. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce him. He, Francois is from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she's an outstanding early career researcher specialized in Arctic barf. Uh, he completed his PhD in 2017 on the study of barf sediments in the Canadian High Arctic, uh, supervised by Pierre Frankis. And he's now a research fellow working with Ray Bradley and Mike Vital Ferguson uh, um, at the University of Massachusetts. And he's developing novel research on Arctic bath and using them to reconstruct modes of climate variability in the North Atlantic Ocean during the late Holocene mainly. So today he's going to tell us about his uh, most recent uh, study uh, published in Science Advance. And this is about the, the onset of the Little Ice Age. So looking forward to it and all yours. Thank you, Celia, and thanks for uh, this uh, invitation. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the help of many great collaborators for this work. So I'm going to start with Ray Bradley, uh, Pierre Francus, Mark Abbott, Nick Balacio, Mike Rattel, Joe Stoner, and Rong Zhang. I would also like to uh, to thank the, the, the funding, so the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Natural Science Engineering Research Council of Canada. This was a grant uh, award, awarded for Pierre Francus, and the Polar Continental Shelf Program of Canada for the log logistic help in the Canadian Arctic. But uh, last but not least, uh, all the research groups for providing public access to their valuable proxy data that uh, I will be showing uh, during this talk. So over the past decade, I was very lucky to work in co collaboration with great people and travel the Arctic uh, to collect exceptional VARF sequences. And among them, uh, the one at Cape NT on Melville Island in the Western Canadian High Arctic, you can see here three a thin section overlapping with really finely laminated sediments. Uh, I also went to Svalbard at Linevatnet Lake. This is the current work I'm doing with Ray Bradley and Mike Rittle in Svalbard, so it shows really uh, awesome barbs here. And I'm also collaborating uh, at Walker Lake on the, the sort of new varves um, that were retrieved uh, within the past five years or so uh, in collaboration with Pierre Francus, as well as uh, at Grand Lake in the Labrador. So you can see those really beautiful varves from this area, which is uh, a relatively new site. And most recently, uh, I was also involved in, the, in collecting sediment cores on Elsmer Island at Stratton Lake, uh, also uh, with uh, the team of Pierre Francus, uh, which involved Leo, uh, Leo Chassio and Arnaud de Canenc. And certainly the VAR record that kept me the most busy so far is the one from South of Lake, also on Ellesmere Island. So this will be uh, the main topic of this talk. So South of Lake is located uh, in the center of uh, Ellesmere Island uh, on the Foshan Peninsula. So here the black contour delimits the uh, watershed of the lake. And you can see here uh, there's uh, this white dashed line, which is the main river that transport uh, sediments to, to, to the lake. And this is a nice view, a nice photograph of uh, the lake taken somewhere in the late 1990s uh, by Pierre Francus. And then if we look at the bathymetric map, uh, you can see that it shows two main basins, one proximal and one distal. Both are about 80 meters deep, and those two are separated by a 60 meter sill. So uh, this configuration is quite ideal because it prevents high energy uh, hydrological events to um, to reach the current site here. So it's a very ideal uh, site to uh, for paleoclimatic studies. And covering in the high Arctic involves strong effort. Here's a, an example uh, that includes the ice covering drilling. 
So the ice cover uh, can be as much as thicker as three meters. So we had uh, to uh, add ex uh, three extensions to the, the, the ice auger. So this is me and, and Nick Palacio. Um, but it's definitely worth the effort because this lake contains awesome bars, very well preserved. So uh, excuse me for the French here. You can see those layers that are associated with summer and winter. So as we've seen in the previous slide during winter, uh, we have a thick ice cover and this allows uh, clay and fine particle to settle down slowly at the lake bottom to form a clay cap. Whereas during summer, we have uh, the melting of this ice cover and the snowpack in the watershed, which brings coarser sediments. So this seasonal cyclicity can, can be used to reconstruct the hydroclimatic conditions over time with, uh, of course, an annual precision. So at left here, we have a section of the core at Southwood Lake showing titanium variability from uh, the iTrax core scanner uh, available at INRS. So we can see that the dark layers are enriched in uh, those uh, the, the titanium values. And when we do a grain size analysis, analysis on these um, darker layers, we see that it's uh, enriched in medium to fine silt. And this is um, linked with uh, the classical snow melt deposit at South of Lake. Whereas uh, the zirconium values are often generally seen in those uh, thinner layers and brighter layers, and they, they're characterized by very fine sand uh, and sand um, grain size. So what we can also do with uh, the thin sections we can collect annual grain size. So here's an example uh, for the year 2007, 6, 2005. So as you can see, the bars can be really thin, less than one millimeter. So uh, it's impossible to uh, collect grain size using classical techniques such as um, uh, laser diffraction. And we collected around uh, 8,000 images to uh, to to have annual grain size until uh, 900 BC, so 2,900 years approximately. Um, so when we plot the fraction finer than 16 microns at Southwood, you can see in red, with the titanium variability in black, you can see a fairly very strong correlation between those two data, data sets. So, um, Titanium input uh, associated with classical snowmelt can be used as a ultra high proxy for for snowmelt events. And by doing spectral analysis on the titanium passery, uh, passery, uh, time series for the past 2900 years, we can see two prominent peaks at around 80 and 42 year cycle. And that is uh, that could be linked with the periodicity seen in the North Atlantic uh, of sea surface temperature from uh, uh, we are talking about the, the 40 to 80 year cycle associated with the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation or the uh, AMV Atlantic multidecadal variability. Uh, so the MO is basically uh, the sea surface temperature uh, from the equator until around 65 degrees north. And when we apply a 10 year low pass filter on the, the, the uh, annual time series, we can see that it shows a multi variability uh, around 40 to 80 year cycle. So now to investigate if our uh, record is linked to any tele teleconnections involved with the AMV, uh, we perform spatial correlations, so from 1856 to present. Uh, this is for SST, of course, but for uh, the reanalysis data of 500 hectopascal, we, we go back to 1979. So titania uh, is correlated to the pressure, the atmospheric pressure at 500 hectopascal here, and you can see uh, a lower pressure system that is pretty much over most of the Canadian high Arctic, 
that reach and extend to the south of uh, Greenland. So that means that when we have uh, lower uh, atmospheric pressure over the Arctic, we have higher titanium concentration in our lake. And if we do the same exercise with the instrumental A and B, we see uh, a similar pattern in, in, in the spatial distribution of this uh, of, of this pressure anomaly, but in uh, oppositely uh, in sign, you know, we have an anti-cyclonic system. Now, uh, by comparing our titanium to the sea surface temperature from 1856 till today, you can see that we have a negative correlation uh, from uh, that is uh, quite similar to what is seen with the instrumental AMV. So our record seems to be able to map the SST uh, variability uh, quite well. And when we compare uh, our record in black titanium, which is uh, inverted, the axis here, to the instrumental AMV in blue, we can see that there is a strong covariability uh, at the interannual inter scale. But it, of course, if we smooth uh, let's say 10 year low pass filter of these data, we, we reach 0.9 of correlation. So it's, it's very significant. And uh, this uh, enabled us to uh, reconstruct the AMV for the past 2,900 years. So you can see that um, there are periods known in the literature that are discernible, such as the Roman warm period, the dark ages, the medieval climate anomaly, the Little Ice Age and the current one period. Um, so you can see that the last decade or so um, is beyond the uh, natural variability of the past 3000 years. But one period that really is an interesting feature in this reconstruction is the one uh, from the late 1300s, which uh, sees really uh, quite warm uh, anomaly that was followed within 20 years or so to the coolest period of the Little Ice Age from 1400 until 1620. And we were uh, wondering what could have occurred during this period of high uh, AMV followed by super cold AMV because uh, this is within uh, the time frame of a human being. So uh, uh, knowing the mechanism that link uh, this transition seems to be really important. And in this regard, a, a new study uh, documents a previously unknown sea ice anomaly in the 14th century. Uh, from This is a story from Maya in, in 2020 in Science Advances, and it shows that um, the proxies, the sea ice proxies from the Fram Strait and the Greenland Sea region uh, depict in accumulation of sea ice during the late 1300. That was followed by a decreased sea ice uh, in that region. And if we look at the subpolar gyro proxies, you can see that there was uh, an increase of sea ice that culminated around 1400s and that acted to cool uh, the Labrador Sea and the subpolar gyre uh, as a whole. So these halters, uh, think that there was a massive um, export of sea ice from the Fram Strait region to the lower latitude, and that um, was linked with an intensified East Greenland current, uh, which led to the 1400 subpolar gyre weakening. And we think that it also led to, uh, to a shutdown of the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation uh, during the 1400s. So we ask ourselves, could this intensified East Greenland current in the late 1300s, in early 1400s, be linked with a stronger North Atlantic current or uh, a stronger AMOC? So it's still not fully understood how the East Greenland current works, but recent monitoring shows that the evolution of the barotropic our Arctic Ocean outflow to the baroclinic conditions of the East Greenland current 
uh, is mod modulated by the recirculating Atlantic waters in the Fram Strait region. So as the North Atlantic uh, water enters the Arctic and reach closer to the East Greenland shelf break, um, the, Arctic Oce the Arctic Ocean outflow becomes increasingly restricted to a narrow band along this uh, uh, Greenland shelf break. So this causes the East Greenland current to gain velocity. So it appears that both the Arctic Ocean water and the Atlantic returning water combine to form the East Greenland current. And that's what we think occurred in the late 1300s because we have uh, one of the most increased uh, positive AMV during that time. So to explore the hypothesis of a strong poleward flux of warm water into the Nordic seas, um, we will use uh, proxies that are highly resolved, so preferably subdecadal resolution, and they need to be uh, located in the track of the North Atlantic current, and that includes the East Greenland current. And those proxies those proxies need to have a chronological tie point in the period of interest. So let's start with uh, a marine record of Norway, which has a very strong uh, sedimentation rate for the last 1,000 years. So as you can see, uh, we have uh, about seven year resolution uh, for this uh, August SST reconstruction at the Voring Plateau here. And we see that uh, for the past thousand years or so, the two data set are reconstructed AMV and this SSD uh, are strongly correlated. And one particular feature of this marine record is uh, the quite warm conditions at the end of, of the 1300s that were followed by an average shift to cooling conditions uh, in the 1400s. And this marine record is located under the direct influence of the Norwegian Atlantic Current, which is a poleward extension of the Gulf Stream where warm and saline water, Atlantic water, enters the Arctic. And if we go northward, um, is here the, the site three, um, we have a record of ice rafted debris that shows two maxima in ice rafted debris that match quite well the two peaks of the late 1300s, uh, the two uh, AMV reconstructed peaks here. And these higher amounts of ice rafted debris are related to increasing iceberg sea ice abundance that originates from <coughs> Western. Maybe somebody could uh, mute their, um, I, I hear coughing a little bit, but. Uh, so these higher amounts of ice rafted debris are uh, related to increasing sea ice or iceberg that originates from Western uh, Svalbard and maybe the result of calving induced by a warmer uh, sea surface temperature. And that's what we, we, we think occurred. Um, if we go to site four here, we have a record of uh, Delta 018 from Cassidulina Neoteritis. Uh, and lower values of delta 18 from neoteritis indicate high calcification temperature that is linked to the inflow of Atlantic water. So you can see that the two peaks at the end of the 1300s fit quite well with our reconstructed AMV. And we also know that the lower uh, delta 18 was recorded around 1080, which match again the uh, warm AMV there. So if we go in the East Greenland current path, so number five here in uh, central Greenland, we have a record of um, um, the Nonnella labradorica. So this species is dynastic of productive intermediate Atlantic waters. Uh, the water associated with a strengthening of uh, the East Greenland current. And we can see that there's a peak that really coincide well with uh, the strong peak of the positive AMB of the, of the late 1300s. And further uh, down, uh, 
at number seven, we have another record of, of ice rafted debris uh, and uh, in the around the Denmark Strait here. And this ice rafted debris reached its highest Holocene values uh, at exactly 13 AD in the common era. Because if I say 13 AD, AD, it's a little bit uh, confusing. So that really means that there was something very uh, big that occurred during this period. Now, if we go to uh, the ice record from Greenland at Diet 3, we have a record of Delta 018. And we see in, in red, this is the Delta 018, and in black is our reconstructed AMV. And it shows a, a really a quite good correlation between the two data sets. And this core is located uh, in that part of Greenland where the influence of North Atlantic maritime air masses is quite strong. And this is reflected by higher snow accumulation uh, in that region compared to the uh, north, north, uh, northernmost ice records of Greenland. And you can see that the two peaks of higher temperature at Dietry uh, fits perfectly with our two peaks uh, seen in our reconstructed MV. And that was followed by an average shift toward cooler temperature in the 1400s. Now, if we go to uh, the northwest extension of the Gulf Stream in the uh, Ermenger current, so here, number eight, we have a record from uh, the Labrador Sea. Uh, so it's Delta 018 Turbo Rotalita Kimkeloba, which is uh, inverted here, such as lower values indicate less polar waters, so warmer waters. So you can see that the peak at around 1380 in the late 1300s fit absolutely well with our reconstructed AMV again, followed by uh, cooler conditions. And if we go to um, Disco bugged here, we have a, a record of a percentage of warm Atlantic uh, indicators in, in purple. And you can see that it increased quite, uh, quite strongly in the late 1300s. And that was followed by uh, a cooling in the 1400s. Uh, and that includes the, uh, the Atlantic species uh, Melonis barlianus, which is um, which reached unprecedented values abundance during this period, around 1380. So together, the current spatial temporal increase in all these highly resolved records uh, in the North Atlantic highlights that uh, the AMV, the warm Atlantic SST, was a critical pre precursor to the extreme uh, ice anomaly of the 1400s. So, the paleo evidence suggests a stronger North Atlantic current in the late 1300s. And this should imply as well a strengthening of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, so the AMOC. Um, so here's a multimodal uh, correlation map between the low frequency AMOC at 26 degree north and sea surface temperature. So as you can see, you, we have a, a warmer subpolar gyre during uh, a strengthening of the AMOC. And this is uh, characterized by a dipole here with a cooler uh, sea surface temperature in the US East Coast and in the Eastern Canada. So um, there are few or any highly resolved sea surface temperature in the US East Coast to uh, investigate the potential dipole pattern However, there is a unique annually resolved sea surface temperature record from the Gulf of Maine, uh, reconstructed from bivalve shells that is in phase uh, with the strong uh, reconstructed AMV here. So you can see that um, the, the, the y-axis is inverted, such as uh, cooler temperature upward and warmer downward. So you, you can really see that it really fits nicely with the, the warm. Uh, so, if we go to Chesapeake Bay uh, in Virginia, in the, the of Virginia, I think it's Virginia. We see, we also see uh, abrupt cooling uh, there, followed by an abrupt warming uh, within 
10 years or so. So this is really dynastic of a strengthening of the AMOC during uh, the late 1300s, followed by a weakening of the AMOC in the, the following um, 1400s. And um, yep. And this AMOC strengthening and weakening is supported by a new sortable silt record from the Iceland Scotland uh, overturning water. So uh, we call it ISO. So this record has an extremely high temporal resolution of about six years throughout the past 3000 years. And a notable feature of this record is the period uh, from 1400 to 1620, which shows the strongest increase in ISO, um, which coincide with the coolest uh, temperature in, in the Atlantic. So strong ISO flow speeds are interpreted as resulting from a reduction in, in the Labrador seawater in the Iceland basin. Uh, so it is linked with a weaker deep water formation in the Labrador sea area, which is a hotspot of AMO changes. And this abrupt anomaly uh, occurred within two decades is unprecedented in the past 3000 years. So it indicates that higher ISO flow speeds uh, were associated with lower Atlantic SST, um, consistent with the notion of a weaker um, deep water formation in the Labrador Sea. So th this is what would be expected from a strengthening of the AMOC in the late 1300s, followed by a weakening of the AMOC. Um, okay. So Fast forward to our times, um, the last time we have seen such a sharp transitions from a warmer uh, subpolar gyre to a colder subpolar gyre uh, was between the warm 1960s to the relatively very cold 1970s uh, until the mid 80s here. So these data are uh, observation from uh, Yasha Yael. Um, and so this period may offer an analogy to the con conditions of the late 1300s to the early 1400s. And we know that um, the 1990s were characterized by a higher pressure system over southern Greenland. So this is uh, typically called a Greenland blocking. It has been suggested that this strong blocking episode of the 60s promoted uh, the accumulation of Arctic sea ice. Uh, this is a study based by Yanita et al. in uh, scientific report in 2016. So they showed uh, their change in the, their model sea ice volume, uh, showing an accumulation of Arctic sea ice in the 60s caused by the atmospheric blocking that was followed by a flush out of sea ice in the 70s that contributed to a weakened subpolar gyre and AMOC few, few years after. But this, this study is linked with model data uh, because there is a huge lack of sea ice extent data before uh, the, the satellite era, of course. But a paper um, by Mizek and Kanak describes uh, sea ice extent anomalies uh, from the 19 from 1953 to 1984. So they used data observed sea ice fluctuation from uh, John Walsh uh, uh, using grid cell data. And using the, these data, they separated the Arctic in subregions. So here I want to draw your attention on subregion five, which comprises the Fram Strait region and uh, the Greenland Sea. And Subregion four, which uh, comprises the Labrador Sea and the Baffin Sea. So, with that in mind, let's see uh, the Arctic sea ice area from Region five, which is the Fram Strait and Greenland sea Seas. So, we can see during the 60s an increase of Arctic sea ice uh, until the, the late 1960. That was followed by um, decrease sea ice extent in the following years. 
And we, if we have a look at uh, the Labrador and Baffin Bay Seas, as expected, we have less sea ice during the 60s because the subpolar gyre was warmer. But upon uh, the, the um, awakening of this atmospheric blocking event, we, we have an increase of sea ice in the Labrador Sea. Uh, and that peaked around the, uh, the end of uh, the mid-1980. Uh, so this looked like a mess, uh, well, a, an export of sea ice from Fram Strait to uh, the, the Labrador Sea during that period, which uh, is somewhat uh, what we think occurred in the late 1300s, 1400s. So that's why here it's a paleoclimatic déjà vu, maybe. So now if we look at the global SST pattern in the period of atmospheric blocking in the 60s, we can see as expected the, the warm subpolar gyre here and the cooler uh, SST in uh, the US East Coast, a diagnostic of a strengthening of the AMOC SST fingerprint. But we also see a cool Southern Atlantic seas. And if we do the same with the period of North Atlantic cooling in the 70s and early 80s, we can see a cooler uh, North Atlantic and a slightly warmer US East Coast and Canada East Coast. But we also see a warmer South Atlantic Sea. And um, <clears throat> indeed, uh, Dima and Lohman identified two distinct modes of variability in global SST dataset, of course, except El Nino. Uh, one that is uh, associated with the gradual decline of the global thermal in circulation. So you can see here, and that's pretty much what is occurring uh, today with global warming. Uh, and a second one associated with a rapid change related to multidecadal variability in the Atlantic. So linked with the AMV. So we have an asymmetric SST pattern uh, during uh, the warm support gyre. Uh, we have cooler uh, sea surface temperature in the southern hemisphere. So we think that this rapid change occurred uh, during the late 1300s. So this is linked with a rapid strengthening and then weakening of the AMOC spanning inter interannual to decadal time scale. So it can really occur uh, super fast. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so here, um, if we want to investigate uh, any um, bipolar sea surface temperature during the, the late 1300s, there is unfortunately no highly resolved Atlantic SST reconstruction in the southern uh, Atlantic. However, the, there exists uh, a unique ice core record in the James Ross Island uh, located in the red star here. And the delta uh, deuterium from this ice core depicts unusual cooling uh, that is remarkably coeval with the strong and warm AMV of the late 1300s. So this ice core record is strongly correlated with air temperature from nearby weather station, which is itself correlated with the sea surface temperature of the surrounding seas. So this adds some evidence to the existence of a rapid strengthening of the AMOC at the end of the 1300s. Now let's look at the precipitation anomalies during the 60s, so during the period of the subpolar gyre warming. So we see uh, the precipitation rate anomaly here. Um, so we have a weather equatorial uh, Pacific Islands, a weather uh, Western Africa, and an overall drier South America. And as you uh, may know, there, there are a lot of proxies out there. So we're going to investigate what they tell, what they tell us about the, the, the precipitation during that time. So in the Pacific uh, at Washington Island, uh, this alter um, uh, document, the southward migra migration of the intertropical continental zone during the Little Ice Age, uh, that was preceded by a more northerly ITCC uh, in the late 1300s, as shown by lower 
uh, delta deuterium values of lipids uh, in that lake, which uh, details weather conditions there and then drier condition. And that match, Lee, uh, that match quite nicely uh, the reconstructed AMV. And if we look at um, the weather conditions in the 60s in the West Africa, well, there's a lake um, that shows uh, altigenic carbonates delta 18 in Lake Bozumtui, uh, which is associated with the balance between precipitation and evaporation. And as the lake is a closed basin, uh, the lower delta 18 is indicative of higher lake level and vice versa. So there was a big fill of this lake right at the end of the 1300s, followed by uh, um, a drier conditions uh, that would be expected from uh, a cooling of the North Atlantic, like in the 70s and early uh, 1885. And if we look at uh, the Peru uh, proxy from Wagapo Cave, the, the OA thing, it details drier conditions at the end of the 1300, which is also uh, supported by the Calcaya ice record, which shows the lowest ice accumulation at the end of the 1300, uh, which is consistent with uh, what we will expect from uh, the 1960s. And uh, around the 1400s, we have an increase of uh, precipitation, and we can see that there was uh, an increase during the North cooling. Uh, anomaly of the 70s and early 80s. So these paleo observations support our hypothesis of a rapid strengthening of the AMOC in the late 14th century, followed by a rapid AMOC shutdown in the early 15th century. So to sum up, the warm support jar in the late 1300s was very likely a period of enhanced atmospheric blocking. So upon this weakening, a flush out of Arctic sea ice occurred and that freshened the subpolar jar and ultimately weakened the AMOC. And the associated teleconnection uh, related to this strengthening and weakening of the AMOC uh, are well expressed in many highly resolved records. And uh, we know that positive phases of the AMV um, result in more persistent atmospheric blocking over the North Atlantic. So here's a comparison between um, the monthly reconstructed, reconstructed Greenland and uh, European 500 hectopascal in, in red from Katsi et al. And, and in purple is the reanalysis data. And you can see that uh, the reconstructed AMV and the these atmosphere, atmospheric blocking uh, strongly covaries together. So that indicates that um, the reconstructed AMV captures these atmospheric blocking events over the North Atlantic. So what could have triggered the late 1300s blocking anomaly? Although it's quite de debated, periods of high solar activity tend to be associated with Atlantic blocking episodes located over South Greenland, whereas during lower solar activity, blocking tends to be confined to the Eastern Atlantic. But Celia, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> the reconstructed AMV is now compared with the most recent reconstruction of solar activity that spans the, the, the last millennium at annual tempor temporal resolution. So we can see that there is uh, a high covariability be between the AMV and the solar modulation. Uh, most notably, the period of uh, higher solar activity, the, the two peaks that fit very well with the reconstructed AMV. Hence, the strong solar activity may have promoted more persistent um, blocking over Greenland that allowed uh, Atlantic SST to reach the subpolar gyre and the Nordic seas more readily. And during that time, the late 1300 was characterized by very few or no major volcanic eruptions meaning that the atmosphere um, was probably cleaner at that time and the effect of 
uh, unusually high solar forcing, forcing on the Atlantic circulation in the North Atlantic may have been particularly strong during that period. Now I'm going to conclude with VARFs are exceptional and unique because they enable to detect and rapid and abrupt uh, change, which is crucially needed to better forecast climate change in the future, as well as understanding tipping points in the climate system. Um, so the strong North Atlantic, North Atlantic current uh, in the late 1300s prom promoted the strengthening of the East Greenland current, which triggered a massive sea ice export that caused the super gyre to weaken, as well as the AMOC. Um, However, we need more uh, SST proxies in key areas that include the US East Coast and the Weddell Sea um, to better document the AMOC variability in the past in order to better forecast its future behavior. And the unusual high solar forcing that coincided with low volcanic activity of the late 1300s seems to have triggered atmospheric blocking that was responsible for the accumulation of Arctic sea ice. And upon the weakening of this blocking event, a massive export of sea ice occurred in the North Atlantic, uh, setting the stage for the entering Little Ice Age. And I will be happy to take your questions. OK. OK. Thank you, Professor. Oh, very nice talk, very interesting.